The reading is um, Colossians chapter 1, which is on the supremacy of Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his faith, His fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading from his word. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for what it teaches us and what it shows us, how it helps us to find the truth. And I pray, Lord God, that today... Um, we would be open to hearing your truth and that uh, you would touch our minds as well as of our heart, as well as of our hearts this day. Lord, please give me the strength to do this. Take this time as yours, Lord. Do whatever you want with it. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't usually start off the sermon with a joke, kind of like Joel Osteen does, but this one combines two things I like, baseball and the Bible. So where... Is baseball mentioned in the Bible? Anybody? That's right. <laughs> That's an old joke. In the big inning. That's right. Oh. In my sermon here, I have the word groan written right after it. And you guys see, so you guys did perfect. That was really good. Today, we want to focus on the beginning. We're continuing our walk through the Apostles' Creed by looking today at God. I believe in God, the creator of heaven and earth. This is the third of the series of messages looking at what the Apostle Creed, Apostles' Creed teaches us as Christians. Apostles' Creed was written in the early centuries of the Christian church as a means of sharing in a very concise and memorizable way the basic beliefs of the Christian church. And many churches around the world do what we just did, recite this creed every Sunday morning as part of their services. And today we want to take a look at the idea that God is the creator of heaven and earth, which is an idea which flies in the face of what many teachers teach, what many scientists write, and even what many average people in the Western world might believe. Though I have a hunch that even more people who wouldn't identify as Christian would, more people than we realize, do accept the idea that there is something out there, a God somewhere out there that had a hand somehow in creating us and bringing us to this point in history. What is commonly taught today, I'm going to move into some stuff that doesn't necessarily fit with the scripture, and then we'll look at scripture afterwards. But what's commonly taught today is the concept of natural evolution. Erickson defines this as the imminent processes within nature that have produced humans and all that there is. There's no involvement by any divine person, either at the beginning or during the process. Our world is the result of chance or random combination of atoms. Chance and random being the operative words here. Evolution believes that the natural processes of nature have been at work over millions of years to create the creatures that we see today, and that no being or force is at work guiding these processes. Strict evolutionists believe that all creatures, whether humans or chimpanzees or fish, have all evolved over time from the same primordial substance. And looking at the biblical account that Gina read for us early today, we can see how it's easy to see how Christians have a hard time believing evolution to be true. The God of Genesis is not using changes due to natural processes to create humans or other creatures, nor is he leaving his creative work to to chance or, or randomness. And as always, it's hard to cover all the elements of such a complex issue in a 23 and a half minute sermon. But allow me to toss out a few things for you to think about. 
before we will get into more of the implications of God's creation of the world and how that applies to our day-to-day life and how it applies to our Christian beliefs and theology. First, let me introduce the idea of microevolution and macroevolution. When I was back in college in Montreal, I studied microeconomics and macroeconomics. For simplicity's sake, micro, as you might have, might assume, means small. It means examining the fine details of something. Macro means big. It's examining the big picture and how the micro fine details might fit into the big picture. I found an interesting online article by a fellow named Kurt Durston, Kirk Durston. And he identifies two issues in the discussion around evolution that takes place. One is that creationists aren't always willing to accept microevolution. And the other is that evolutionists see microevolution and they use that information to take leaps of faith and form macro, big evolutionary theories. So Charles Darwin, the father of modern evolutionary theory, boarded his ship called the Beagle in 1835 and went to the Galapagos Islands. And there he saw all kinds of animals that he had never seen before. And some that caught his eye were various types of finches, birds. And he noticed that the beaks of the finches varied from island to island and varied from their environment and their eating habits varied. And he made the theory that these changes were the ways that the birds adapted to their environment. And over the years, others have made similar observations of different creatures, and they've come to the conclusion that this adaption to the environment can over time be expanded and extrapolated to show that creatures have adapted over millions of years to the extent that fish, in the extreme example, fish can grow legs and become land creatures. Not all at once, of course, but over the passage of time. So Durston and other scientists have difficulty with evolution because evolutionary scientists, on the, for the most part, are seeing microevolution, seeing small changes, evolution within a species, and assuming that it is proof for macroevolution, for the big picture, Evolution from, from one, where one type of species becomes another. Microevolution is happening in our world all the time. Creatures adapt to their surroundings in order to survive. There are variations of genetic material that can happen to cause perceived changes in a being or an organism. One example we've heard in the news is um, bacteria that's become resistant to our antibiotics. This doesn't mean that they've become something totally different. It's just that they've adapted themselves so that they can they can fight off the antibiotics and continue to survive. What is not happening in our world, a lot of scientists would say this, and and I would contend has never happened in our world, is macroevolution, the big thing, evolving from one species, becoming another. Because doing so would require more than just, you know, changing the genetic material that's already in a species. It would involve introducing whole new genetic material into a species. And this, Durston says, is extremely difficult to achieve. Durston defines the mistake evolutionists make. They make the assumption that because variation within a species, microevolution, small changes, is such an overwhelmingly proven fact, therefore macroevolution, the big picture, evolution from one form of species to another, must be a fact as well. And he identifies that as a mistake. So if you ever get into a discussion about evolution with someone, one of the first things to try to determine is whether they're talking about microevolution or macroevolution. And if the proofs they're giving you are really proofs for, for macroevolution, for evolution from one species changing into another, as they're claiming, or if, is their evidence really just proof for micro? The accepted fact that species within a species will adapt and change to their environment without becoming a whole different, entirely new species. Now, another issue with the theory of evolution is that it does not answer the question of first cause. It doesn't answer how we got here. It tells us that humans descended from apes or fish or primordial sludge, but it cannot answer where the primordial sludge came from. Since the theory of evolution is tied up in processes, it cannot answer the question of where the process started. I was surprised to learn a few years ago that evolutionists are not huge fans of the Big Bang Theory. I mean the actual theory, not the TV show. 
I'm sure evolutionists don't mind sitting in front of the TV and laughing at Sheldon and Leonard, just like the rest of us. But no, I mean, evolutionists wrestle with the idea of a first cause and whether that cause was God or the Big Bang. The late Stephen Hawking, a world-famous physicist, wrote concerning the Big Bang, it would be very difficult to explain why the universe should have begun in just such a way, except as an act of God who intended to create beings like us. Now that sounds like Hawking should, would believe what Christians believe, but he in fact saw this not as an explanation, but as a problem. A problem to be overcome and to be dealt with. And so he had to come up with speculative theories about the universe being self-contained, that it wasn't created, that and it can't be destroyed. In other words, the universe always was. And that's the thing over the years that's always struck me. No matter what theory you come up with for first cause, how you got, how we got here, what created us, it seems there has to be something that always was. And I always scratch my head as to why people can bend over backwards to believe that uh, the thing that always was was the universe or aliens or primordial sludge. They can believe that that always existed, but they have a hard time believing that God always existed and always was. So if you ever get into a discussion with someone about evolution, ask them about first cause. How did the universe get here? Okay, fine and dandy, say we evolved, but we evolved ultimately from what? Another aspect of this discussion that I've been very interested in over the last 20 years, and I talk to young people about it because it's something they could use in school, is the development of the intelligent design theory. The intelligent design theory. A number of scientists, including a number of Christian scientists, have developed this theory and they've applied what they call information theory to biology. And they argue that the more complex an object is, and the more it adheres to specific patterns, then it demonstrates the likelihood that it was actually designed. This is an extension of the old story of a watchmaker. You're walking through the woods, you see this tree stump, and there's a watch, one of those old-fashioned watches sitting on a tree stump. And you think, how did it get there? And you think, well, some guy in the watchmaking shop in the village must have thought it up, taken the component parts for the watch, put it together, went for a walk in the woods, and for some reason just kind of left it on the tree stump. You wouldn't sit there and kind of go, hmm, well, that watch must have just come together by random chance. All the pieces of the watch must have just kind of flown together in the universe and landed on this tree stump and somehow worked together to become this watch that's now telling me that it's quarter after 12 in the afternoon and it's, it's working and winding itself up. You would never assume that the intricate parts of the watch just evolved into place. You would never assume that it worked simply by chance, or that it's found its way on the tree stump totally randomly. And yet people look at the intricate and complex world that we have and believe that it happened by chance. That the fitting together of all the incredible parts of nature was a random fluke. But no one would ever think about a watch found on a tree stump that way. In a, mod in a more modern sense, same thing with computers. I know we kind of just use computers, we take them for granted, but but we always assume there's a programmer somewhere, like someone programmed everything we use in a computer. Something so complex could not have simply happened by chance. It had to somehow be programmed, even if we don't understand it. And we can't explain, I can't explain a computer, I can barely turn one on. But we always assume that somewhere there's a programmer behind it all. And the intelligent design theory doesn't explain how creation happened. That's why some Christians have a hard time with it. It doesn't explain it. It just logically proclaims that logically a world this complex had to have a designer, had to have an intelligent creator. And the phrase people use behind the intelligent design theory is specified complexity. Complicated word, but, but it means the more spe specific something is and the more complex it is, then the more likely it is that it didn't happen by chance that it had to be designed. I'll give you an example. Kaylina, you still awake? <laughs> Come on up here. Kaylina is good in Scrabble, so she's going to help me with an example. These, this is a bag of Scrabble tiles from the Scrabble game that we play at youth. So I'm going to hold this bag, and I'm going to ask Kaylina to pull out three Scrabble tiles, and, you can, and what I want you to do is pull out three vowels in a row. Just reach in and see if we pull out three, any vowel. doesn't matter what it is, three vowels. What do we got? Oh, there's one. Okay, good. We got A. Okay, okay. Two in a row. Doing good. J. 
She did it, 3A. I practiced this a few times before, yesterday, and I didn't do it. So yeah, it wasn't very specific instructions, and nor was it very complex. I just said, pull out three tiles that have vowels, OK? And so she randomly was able to do it. Now I want you to pull out three tiles in a row that spell the word cat, C-A-T. So let's see if you can get a C first. If you do, I'll be amazed. D, OK, no, I can't do that. OK, try another one. A, no, it's got to be in order, so I need to see first. Is this working? <laughs> oh, no, no, it's OK, never mind. So, so cat, more specific than just saying three vowels, but not very complex. It's only a three-letter word. But even at that, by chance, we couldn't pull it out of the bag. Now I want you in order to pull out the letters that will spell the theory of evolution. T-H-E, T-H-E, O-R-Y, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so start, see if we can get a T. This is totally weird. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't think so? J, no, no, it's, it's, let's change it to my name. Look that, Jeffrey. Y, okay, we got the Jeffrey in the middle. We're not doing well with the theory of evolution here. Let's see. T? Z? <laughs> this is a lousy Scrabble hand. J, Y, and Z. Just going to lose 28 points right there. T. No, okay, we're not worried. <laughs> oh, you got a T. Finally, okay. See if you get an H. She got a T. I. See, no, okay. Thanks, Kalina. You see, theory of ev the theory of evolution, more specific, more complex, the, fact that I, the probability of that happening by chance is pretty slim. We'd be sitting here for months drawing tiles but to get that, that phrase in order. If we were to see the theory of evolution laid out in Scrabble tiles, we would have to assume that somebody said, well, I know how to spell, and so I'm going to use that intelligence to uh, knowing how to spell to lay those tiles out in that specific order. The famous atheist biologist Richard Dawkins defines biology like this. He says, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. So he's not willing to say that things in nature are designed for a purpose because that would give, that would then logically lead to the existence of a designer. So we can only admit that they give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. But in science, you follow the evidence to where it leads. And if things appear to have been designed for a purpose, then perhaps that's because, well, they've been designed for a purpose. And the challenge to all of us, the challenge which goes beyond science, is determine what's that purpose? What is the purpose for creation? Believing that God is the designer and that creating the world was according to his good purpose, then what does it mean in our practical day-to-day -day lives that he is the creator? How does this go beyond just discussions and debates about science that have nothing to do with my daily life? What are the implications of believing that God is the creator? Well, first it tells us that God is God and I'm not. We're created. We're not in charge. We're not the center of the universe, even though there are people out there who might believe that they are, especially in Toronto. We used to tell this joke in Montreal. How many Torontonians does it take to screw in a light bulb? Just one to hold the light bulb while the rest of the world revolves around him. My favorite Montreal joke. There's a kid who comes to our youth group every week. And I think I can say this because I've said this to his face. His biggest problem, I think, is that he believes he's the center of the universe. That what he wants for himself always comes first, no matter what anybody else wants. He's the one I always have to say, I said, put a limit on two cookies. Why are you taking six? Um, that the world is there to please him and that everything revolves around him. There are lots of people who may not seem as obvious as this kid, but they still believe the world revolves around them. And the first step to a relationship with God, the first step to having an amazing relationship to the, with the creator of the universe is to acknowledge that he is the creator and we are the created. That God minus the world is still God, as one commentator wrote. And that we as approach God the creator with an attitude of humility when we, as the scripture says, humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, then he will be the one who lifts us up. Secondly, knowing that God is creator tells us that only God is eternal. 
As we read in Genesis, everything that exists derives its existence from him. He is creator and he is almighty. But among that, as we looked at a couple weeks ago, he is also father. And he opens the door through his son, Jesus Christ, for us created beings to have a father-child relationship with the creator of the universe. How amazing is that? Third, this means by the means by which God created all that exists was by the simple use of his words. We read in Genesis 1, God said, let there be, and there was. He spoke the world into existence, and it came out of nothing. God alone can create something from nothing, can make something from what was not there before. Hebrews 11.3 says that by faith we understand that the universe was formed by God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. There's a measure of faith in accepting this because as Thiessen writes, science cannot answer the questions of origins or first cause. The way I look at it, I think the Big Bang was the booming voice of God speaking the world into existence. And quite frankly, any other theory can just can't top that. It can come up to it as, as level or below it. Any other theory is just as good or just as bad. Thomas Oden writes, the created order springs directly from the word of God. It is produced, ordered, and approved all by God's speech. The 13th century theologian Thomas Aquinas wrote, creation is viewed as divine, as a divine language that only God can speak. God's word is creative power. And that has huge implications for us today as believers because God has given us his word. He's given us the scriptures. And when we get his word into our hearts and into our minds and when we read it and when we understand it and when we live it, God creates something new inside of us. His word creates a new life in Christ where old things begin to pass away and we become more and more the person that God created us to be, to fulfill his purpose for us. And when we speak to God's word to other people, it has the power to create as well, to create peace where there's fear, to create love where there is hate, to bring new life to that spiritual part of someone that might have died a long time ago. God's word has creative power, and he has given that to us to bring new life to ourselves and new life to others. Sometimes I think we take for granted the power that is in God's word. And for some unknown reason, we tend to ignore it, not read it, not make his word a part of our lives. May we allow God's word to sink deep into our hearts. For if anyone is in Christ, the scripture says they are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Not only did God's word create the world, but it is the power of Christ that holds it together. Colossians chapter 1, which Christine read for us, tells us that all things have been created through Christ and for Christ. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Romans 11.36 says of Christ that from him and through him and for him are all things. In this world that sometimes seems spinning out of control, our knowledge that God is creator tells us that it, it is he, it is Christ, that is holding everything together. And that no matter how crazy things get, no matter how uncertain things get in our lives, he is holding everything together, both micro in our individual lives and macro in the world as a whole. Our theology of God as creator means that everything has value because God created it. We have no right to call anything or anyone God created worthless, including yourself. You are of infinite value because of, because you are created by God. Yet among the created order, the specifics of God's creation activity show us that humans are of more value than the animals and plants. Environmentalists have it right when they say that it is our responsibility to look after the earth. God put us here in charge of nature that he created in order to take care of it so we can benefit from it. But some environmentalists have it wrong when they place the needs and concerns of plants and animals on a par with, or even greater than, humans. The difference is this. Out of everything that God created in Genesis 1, there's only one thing that God created 
in his own, own image, and that's humans. Thomas Oden writes, humanity is very like and unlike the animals, since, yes, they're grounded in nature, yet they are capable of freedom, self-transcendence, consciousness, refracting the divine image. Even Jesus said that humans are worth more than the birds of the sky and the lilies of the field. All nature is God's creation, but only humans are made in God's image, and that includes male and female. Genesis 1.27 tells us, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We are all made in the image of God. And the goal and purpose of our lives is to live out that image, to allow the image of God to be formed in us more and more with each passing day as that we walk this earth that God created. For that's another implication of the theology of God as creator. We have a purpose. There is a plan. We are not random. You're not an accident, no matter what anyone might have told you in the past. You are not an, a haphazard fluke of chance. You are created in the image of God, with the love and care of God, to fulfill the purpose that God has created you for. Listen to Psalm 139 as I read it to you. As the author pens this poem to God, his creator. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. See, God knew you from the beginning, from your mother's womb. And God has a plan from the beginning for all your days. And God thinks about you a lot. I think one of the most negative implications in society of the theory of evolution is that it teaches people, especially our young people, that there's no ultimate purpose in life, that they are here by random chance, by accident, that there's no intelligent designer that put us here for a purpose. And therefore, they define their own purpose, which in our North American society becomes he who dies with the most toys wins. And they miss out on the incredible plan and purpose that God has created us for. If there's one thing you come away with this morning, let it be this truth. You are not random. You are not an accident. God created you with a plan and a purpose. And he wants to walk with you to help you discover that. Finally, let me read to you Psalm 19, starting at verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet, their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. The heavens declare the glory of God. Some people look into the heavens and they miss that declaration. They look and they marvel at how amazing it is that this was all created by chance, by some fluke of nature, by some one in a gazillion coincidence. But then there are others. When I was 17 years old, I was at a weekend retreat with my church youth group at Camp Livingstone in the eastern townships of Quebec. And I decided one, at the end of one night to go out for a walk to the end of the wharf. And this city boy looked up into the cloudless night and saw a sky without light pollution. I had never seen so many stars in my life. It was absolutely incredible. I felt the immenseness of God. I, I was awed by the majesty of his creation. To put it simply, I was blown away. And yet, in all that vastness, I felt that God was very, very near. And I looked up at the stars for a few minutes, just kept saying wow to myself. I whispered a prayer of worship. I smiled. And I went back to join my friends in the guy's cabin at the camp. 
carrying a simple but deep experience that I've never forgotten. God is our creator, and his creation declares his glory. And part of that glory is you and me, not an accident, but people loved by a father who knit us together in our mother's womb with a purpose for our lives. A father who longs to help us live out what we were created to be, what he created us to be. Would you bow your heads and pray with me, please? Lord, thank you so much that we are not an accident. Thank you, Lord, that all of this is not random, that you've designed such complex things the human body, even as comp- the human eye, the, the nature, the plants, the animals, the stars, the galaxies, boggles our mind. Thank you, Lord God, for the fact that you created that for a purpose. And Lord, I pray that you would help us in the midst of everything to find that micro purpose, that purpose for us, what it is that you want us to do, what it is that you, how it is you want us to fit into this beautiful world you've created. For we're not here by accident. I pray, Lord, if anyone's ever been told that they were an accident, that they've ever been told that they're worthless, I pray, Lord God, that you would just crowd out those lies out of their mind right now and you would fill their mind with the truth that they are worth more than anything, that they are valuable, that they are not an accident, that you created them for a purpose, and that you have amazing things planned for their life if we would just cooperate with you. Help us, Lord, to remember, as we heard before, to always be reminded that the heavens declare the glory of God. And every time we see something in nature or something in ourselves that makes us say, wow, I pray, Lord God, that that would always be a word of praise and a word of thanks to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.